Welcome to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. This is the only podcast that gives you a raw and unfiltered perspective of what it's really like to be a professional cheerleader. Whether you're currently on a pro team, an alumni, or really curious about what it takes to become a pro cheerleader, the Pro Cheerleading Podcast gives you all the inside scoop and hot topics in the pro cheerleading industry and in-depth interviews of team directors, choreographers, current and former cheerleaders. I'm your host, Makiba. Join me every Wednesday as I reveal the truth behind the pause. Hey, everybody. This week's episode is called Talk That Talk because I am actually talking to a fellow podcaster by the name of Bridget Case. She is a former Charger girl when they were in San Diego, and she reached out on Instagram because she came across the podcast and I I was looking at her Instagram about her podcast, but she is a creator and host of a podcast called After Orange Slices, and it kind of covers what athletes go through from all different sports after they retire and some of the things that they struggle with, whether it's addiction or just finding themselves career paths post their professional career. So I thought it was a really, really cool podcast and she agreed to be on the show. So I'm super excited to get into that interview. But first, you know, we got to hit some cheer chat. I'm not sure if you watched the NBA All-Star Game. I admittedly did not pay attention to all of the festivities, but I'll just say once again, I'm just really sad that the NBA does not honor its all-star dancers in the same way that the NFL has Pro Bowl. I just don't understand why they moved away from it. I mean, I think it's great that the Chicago Lovables and it looked like the Brooklyn Nets were there along with their male dance crew. The Brooklyn Nets are dope. The Lovables are dope. I just wish there was like a representative from each team similar to the NFL because it would just be a really cool celebration of seeing all the NBA teams represented that have dancers. Um, But it looked like everybody had an amazing time. The performances were great from what I saw. What do you guys think? Should the NBA have all-star dancers just like the NFL has Pro Bowl cheerleaders? Anyway, that's what I want to see. Well, the NBA is in full gear. I think this is their halfway point for the season. So definitely still watching all of the NBA teams that we follow on Instagram and social media to see what you're up to for the year and all of the cool routines that you're doing. What else is going on? Okay, first of all, I need to know who all is watching this Dare Me stuff on TV. It's a cheerleading TV show on USA Network. And I admit I fell off the last couple of episodes, but if other people are watching, then I I need some engagement. I think I need to talk crap about it or really have somebody to go back and forth with. Similar to how the Netflix cheer special went, a lot of people were really engaged and commenting and posting about it. Maybe Dare Me's just not that hot, but I want to know from you if you're actually watching because A, I need to get caught up and B, I just am curious of what people's reactions are. I was surprised to see one of the characters boning on the show. I guess that's allowed now on TV. Who knows? (laughs) But uh, besides that, it is a pretty good storyline. It's been slowly unfolding, but... If you are watching, hit me up and let me know because I want to see what your thoughts are on on the series just to see if you guys are keeping up with it. I'll tell you this. Another thing that I'm super, super excited to watch and I'm kind of hot that I didn't have enough time over the weekend is the documentary about the NFL cheerleaders who had brought lawsuits against their teams. It's called A Woman's Work, the NFL's cheerleader problem. And I'm super excited to watch that and interview the director, We You, and definitely have a conversation about this documentary and sharing it with you all. I've been dying to see this film and I cannot wait to just have like peace of mind where I can totally dig in and take notes and have a super spirited discussion around it. But stay tuned for that because that will be coming up next month. I can't believe they're already like in freaking March pretty much. 2020 is flying by already, but the season is in full swing, you guys. Hoping that it'll be a lot more interactive and getting ideas from you guys about episodes i think it's so cool even today's episode with bridget you know reached out over instagram so it's like people are reaching out over instagram about their stories and eager to share and possibly be a guest on the show i welcome that wholeheartedly because 
it's really hard to just keep an eye on everything and everyone and reaching out to people for uh, potential interviews. But if you feel like you have a unique story to share or a topic that really you're passionate about that you would like covered on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out because we'll get something scheduled. We'll get an interview going. Don't be shy. It's really hard sometimes to get clearance from people who are on teams to do interviews. So if you're a retired alumni and you're doing something really crazy dope, just please reach out. Happy to connect with you and share your story through the podcast. With that, let's just get into my conversation with Bridget, another former NFL cheerleader who decided to do a sports podcast, mainly because of her background in journalism. But we're going to dig into how she got started with journalism, some of the challenges she's experienced. So I won't give too much more away. Let's get into Talk That Talk. Well, welcome, Bridget, to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. I'm so excited to have you. I mean, Thank you. I've been, of course, stalking you like crazy. <laughs> beautiful Instagram page. You are a former... I can't say Los Angeles. The minute I get Los Angeles. I am. Well, I didn't cheer in LA, so it's good. That's it's good. still San Diego to San me. Diego. So Yeah, so you are a San Diego Charger girl, and now you are the creator, producer, and host of your very own podcast, After mm-hmm. Orange Slices. I can't wait to get into all of your background and just how you started on this journey of, you're a straight up sports reporter, podcaster, you name it. Like you've been in this business for a while now, right? Yeah, it's been not crazy long, but probably what, about six years now, but it's just, gosh, just been so fun. And I mean, it feels like forever because I've had so many jobs. It's kind of how the industry is. You just hop around, but yeah, I'm loving it. But thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be on the other side of the microphone today. I know, right? I asked a million questions, so. Go for it. They'll be all over the place, but let's just dive into your dance backgrounds. How long have you danced? How did you start? Where did you train? All that kind of good stuff. And yeah. I mean, I started dancing really, really young. Mostly, I'm sure like any elite dancer, you were turning and running into things and running around your house and your parents just put you in a class to finally like calm you down. Um, Yeah, so I started dancing at two years old, really, really young. And I was always like the only one who knew the routine, right? Like I watch all my old recitals and it's just so funny at like three years old. I'm like the only one and I'm like pointing at everybody like telling them to you know get in your spot ladies yes, yeah. get formation so bossy <laughs> so bossy and oh gosh it's just so hilarious and like there's people like laughing at me and cheering me on because I'm the only one I'm just like full on just making up my own solo at like four years old so honestly like dance just became like my second nature of course like I played sports when I was younger and you know played soccer and played tennis but you know got really really serious about dance probably by the time I was like in first second grade um you know I was competing I was you know traveling around the country that young. yeah I started competing I think when I was seven or eight and it just kind of became my life I mean I I loved dance, but I also just didn't really know anything else. Like that just kind of became my identity instantly. Like I was so praised for being good. um, And that's what people knew me for. And I really struggled in school, um, not academically, but just like with friends, like I never felt like I really fit in. So for me, dance was really like a coping mechanism to protect myself from feeling the things that I felt like all the social anxiety that I dealt with, like major social anxiety. So dance was like my shield. That was kind of my beard that I used. Yeah. So I competed basically all through high school and and I was on my um, high school song team, which is basically a dance team. And we competed nationals every year, won a couple of national championships at Florida. My last little stint competing, I was training at well, I was training at lots of different studios. I first started at Tustin Dance Center when I was really young. And then I was training at Jimmy DeFore for a really long time, which is a really no- well-known studio. And then, you know, I I'd get a lot of ballet training at Anaheim Ballet. And then I ended my training years at um, Just Plain Dancing, which when I was there was ranked the top dance studio in the country. And uh, honestly, like it was so hard being there because like I would come home crying you know after after practice some days because my teachers were so difficult but I am so grateful for them like they gave me the toughest skin I mean like it's crazy like dance moms is like real stuff yeah and I will forever be so grateful for them because they turned me into the dancer that I became in college and 
also just the person that I became. Like I really developed thick skin. And so once I graduated, I went to Oregon and I was a cheerleader for four years at the University of Oregon. And it was like the best time to be there because we went to three BSCS bowl games, went to the national championship my freshman year. Of course we lost and it was like the worst night ever, but it was also the most amazing, incredible experience. Like I couldn't have asked for a better four years there. Such magical times. We went to the Rose Bowl, we went to the Fiesta Bowl and just being like the top football team in the country. Yeah, for it was sure. Amazing. It was just so fun. And then of course, once I graduated, then that's when I decided to go to the NFL. And that's when I decided to audition for the Chargers. And I really didn't know if I would make it. I just honestly had no clue because I saw so many girls that I grew up with dancing with who would audition for Charger girls year after year and not make it. So, yeah, so it was hard. I mean, like my captain, my first year, she auditioned six times before making the team. You know, it's cutthroat, but also it was so worth it. And I'm glad I did it. I cheered from 2014 to 2016. And of course there are parts of me that yes, I wish I cheered longer, but also I had major nagging back injuries and also mentally, I just couldn't really do it anymore. I was burnt out. There were just like more things that I wanted to accomplish in life, especially like as a journalist, because I was starting to focus more on my journalism career. So that's when I retired. That's, yeah. that's my long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> I love it, but you answered so many other questions. Uh, so were you balancing your journalism career while you were a Charger girl? Oh my gosh. It was so insane. Yes. So when I was at Oregon, I never really had time for internships, but also I will say this. I didn't fight for them hard enough. Mm. I had four to six weeks summer, not even six weeks, but we didn't have a long summer because we had to be back for getting ready for football season, right? So most internships were like 10 weeks. So I would either apply to things and people would say no, but instead I could have just used my connections and been like, hey, like I only have this much time. I'm a student athlete at Oregon. Like, could I just, you know, come and shadow you for a bit? I was too afraid to do any of that. So I really was behind when it came to having journalism experience outside of school once I was trying to break into the field. So while I was still dancing with the Chargers, I applied to anywhere between like 40 to 80 at a time internships, like anything. I would take anything media related. And I just kept getting rejection after rejection. This was like over the course of a year. It was so bad. Finally, I decided to apply for an internship in Palm Springs at NBC Palm Springs. And that's two and a half hours away, right? From San Diego. So I just was like, I'll apply and maybe I could do like a part-time thing. We'll just see what happens. But also I had to lie and say that I was in grad school because you had to do it for class credit. So Mm -hmm. I lied and said that I was going to grad school. So I get accepted to this internship, which is great. And then they like want to see my grad school information. So I'm like, shoot, I, I got to go apply. <laughs> got to go apply to grad school. You're kidding. So I end up, yeah. So I end up applying to grad school at USC, getting in. And it was great because I mean, like at that time I was going to school very part-time. So it was manageable, but also I like never slept. I barely ate. It was, oh my gosh, it was so bad, but also best experience of my life. So I got this internship. I was only an intern for maybe like a month until they needed a production person. So then I got hired as a production specialist a month later, then their local sports reporters slash multimedia journalist leaves to go get a new job. So the main anchor really liked me. Like I worked really, really hard. So he kind of was the one who pushed for me, went to our news director and was just like, Hey, let's give her a shot. You know, I had been going on the desk and just practicing, practicing every day. Like I didn't care what it was. I would work the morning show from 3am to 12 noon. And then I would drive back to San Diego two hours and go to practice from like six to 11. And then I would drive back, sleep on the couch for like an hour and go to work. I would just take naps wherever I could, but I was just doing anything to break into the industry at this point, right? There were so many times though, where I like basically was falling asleep at the wheel and had to pull over. I would be on the phone with my parents just to try to stay awake. It was really scary and 
very dangerous. So I would never recommend anybody do that. But like, I, I just was doing what I had to, to get my start. And so by that point, then I was the part-time because mostly I was still like the news assistant and production specialist. So I was going out covering, you know, any, anything that happened, lots of breaking news. I was going out to standoffs and things like that on Fridays and the rest of the weekend, I would cover local sports and that's how I got my start in sports. But it was really difficult because of course I would have to leave, you know, whenever we had an appearance or like we had a game or something, you know, so balancing the two was really, really difficult. So that was obviously like a major factor as far as like, I was like, okay, like it's, it's time for me to be done. Yeah. How many years? Yeah. I just also felt like there were so many things that went into being a charger girl that like, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to cheer in the NFL. It was so wonderful. And I got lucky to, you know, travel places and go to France and, you know, do cool things that like, you know what it's like. It is really special, but also there are so many things that I felt so trapped Mm. um, because we weren't allowed to have social media we weren't allowed to have our full name on social media. I know now things have changed and like we have now the restrictions too, though. Right. Like yeah. it was just the, the rules were just, they seemed very, very over the top at the time. And it really played with my head. Of course there was so much like that went into it, but it also felt like, well, I can't grow as a journalist if I can't you can <laughs> be, in, in be on social media. media. Exactly. Yeah. And like, so it was, it was kind of ridiculous. So yeah, that's kind of when I had to like call it quits and say goodbye. But then I just kept moving my way up the ranks as a reporter. And then, yeah, that's how I'm here. Wow. No, you're so right. I think in a, the rules episode talking about just how restrictive it is, I think they've loosened them up a little bit, but it was really yeah. hard to establish, you know, life after cheerleading. If you're not able to promote that you were an NFL cheerleader or, yeah. I mean, it was so restrictive. It was ridiculous in a way. Um, they claim it's to protect you, but at the same time, you know, we're all grown women, you know? So it's Seriously. Like- I'm like, but it's also just not fair because I'm like, well, the players get to post all this stuff. Yeah. Why, why are we being penalized for this? Like, that's not fair. No. So, you know, I just felt like it was so unequal and just, I don't know. I'm like, I'm not getting paid enough to not you know, keep protected. It's you know, it's like yeah. a disadvantage. Um, Absolutely. When the season launched, um, the episode was focused on pro cheerleaders in retirement, interviewed a woman that did her dissertation research on the impact of retirement on pro cheerleaders. But I just yeah. think if you were allowed to have an identity that you could manage, you know, as your own, prof- I mean, you know, how everybody is with branding now, like everybody's yeah. got a presence, yeah. um, kind of treat their social media as like their public figure type thing. Yes. And I think if you have the flexibility to market yourself and do it in a way that hopefully is professional, isn't like reflect negatively on the team, but you should have some latitude. I mean, maybe some of the girls were just so young that they had to have yeah. some rules or some guidelines, but you can have training for that as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. Like, you know what I mean? To just cross that off so that people can use it in a responsible way, but right. you should absolutely have that ability to to build yourself up and to be able to market yourself. Teach the women how to market themselves so that they yeah. can have opportunities after they stop. But also it's more about that, like marketing yourself and being able to be yourself. Like the players are able to be themselves on social right. media. Right. But I felt like when I was a Charger girl, I was Bridget the Charger girl versus Bridget Case like the human being, I was trained what to say, how to respond to certain questions, what not to say, what to steer away from, not to have my own opinion. It was very, like, the more I think back on it, it was very restrictive as far as like what I thought, you know, I I really just felt like I wasn't allowed to like be a, a real person yeah well I was so obsessed when when you had reached out just realizing that you know that you were a sports reporter just because Mm -hmm. of my passion for sports and I just remember I mean listening what you're saying just now um I was like a guest co-host on it was a radio show not even a podcast but okay um but I was so excited to talk football with these guys and like you know and I just remember all of the guidelines I got um when I made the appearance of like don't try to answer questions about Uh football and I was just kind of like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I mean, I'm not some football whiz, but I know the game and I watch it and I pay attention. So I totally. can't 
like if you're trying to like dispel this myth of stupid cheerleaders or that you know don't know the game or don't know what they're watching like why not I mean if it was a question that was over my head literally I wouldn't fumble my way through it and act like I knew the answer if I didn't know but I just kind of I was like okay I'm gonna take this little these guidelines but I did not follow them when I was on the show and because you know <laughs> I could not help myself it's like if you ask me a question oh, I'm gonna answer it that's just not it's not fair and why yeah. should I sound like a dumb cheerleader up there when they brought me on and wanted to hear like my perspective from being on the exactly. sideline there's so many commonalities I was just like man I'm going for it and if I get in trouble then oh well but I know uh, so frustrating and I can only imagine especially if you're balancing you know establishing your career in sports as a broadcaster like that's not it's not gonna work no, I mean it just and, that. and that's what I realized I was like this is not gonna work it's just not and I'm not going to be able to create like the relationships that I need to develop. I'm not going to be able to market myself um, because I wasn't even allowed to like brand myself with another like company Company. besides the chargers. You know what I mean? It was like, they owned me at the time. It's so interesting. I know a lot of that has changed because just our digital media climate, the way it is, which, so I'm super happy that it has changed, but man, it was just, it was so restrictive. Like, I mean, I just think about it now and I'm like, I'm running these podcasts and, you know, I'm co-hosting a podcast and like, I'm co-hosting, you know, a show with Robert Turbin. And again, like you're saying, I would usually be on a show with somebody else and not be able to talk and be honest. And we just did our first episode at Super Bowl, And then we did our second one last week and I was able to get so honest. And he was just like asking me things it was just really funny to get, you know, the perspectives from both of us. I don't know. It's just one of those things where I wish it were different. And I think like it will change eventually, Mm -hmm. but the fact that like, we're not able to be honest and speak our own minds. And yet here, like Robert's sitting there and he's able to speak his own mind and he's still playing. Yeah. That's not fair. I mean, like, I'm not complaining. I love, I love doing our show. It's great, but. um. No, but it's so true. Guys were allowed to kind of say whatever. They're allowed to have their personalities. Brands are able to pick up on that. And it's our little window of, you know, so-called fame is, is pretty small. There are teams that I think are better at allowing the the women to kind of be themselves on social media, keep their own personal social media to promote uh, their time on a team which, you know, is different from having like a, I don't know, for the Seahawks, we were called Seagulls back in the day, but Seagull Makiba. But see, that's the thing. We weren't even allowed to have like Charger Girl Bridget. We couldn't even have that. See, and we didn't for a while. (laughs) They added that in, but it really wasn't always the case. So what inspired you starting your own podcast? Well, I had left my last job. Like I had told you, you know, I was working in Tri-Cities. I was working at the CBS station up there and I ended my last contract and I just felt like, the offers weren't rolling in like crazy. I initially, it, this was about a year ago. So yeah, it was about February, March. I had a really great agent that I thought at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was told that, okay, like we're working on this deal. You know, you might be able to go to Dallas for, you know, this much. Like we were talking money, like we were really close to certain things. And then these things would just keep falling through. And I just felt like Nothing seemed like the right fit as far as the smaller stations that like I could just go fall back on. Mm -hmm. And I had worked so hard in smaller markets to create myself and build myself up that I felt like I was also missing out on this digital movement that I had been missing, like basically because I was working in cable news. Of course, you still try to promote your work on social media, but you're not as active in it. I don't know how to explain it, but nobody's watching TV anymore. Everybody's just watching their like stuff on their phones. I was getting paid nothing, like barely $20,000. It's a hard life. So of course, like I don't do it for the money. That's not why, but I also felt like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go back, move home with my parents and just regroup, figure things out. Mm -hmm. And I was so depressed. I just felt like, you know, I've failed. Everybody hates me. Like I'm not meant to survive in this world as a journalist. I'm just not talented. And, you know, just all of those, all of those thoughts come flooding in, right? All of those negative thoughts. And then just one day it came to me and I just realized, you know what? It's 2019. It's the day and age where we can all really create ourselves. You do not have to rely on a company. That's so So true. Exactly. So that's what I was like. I'm going to create my own podcast 
And the hardest part for me was that I was not on Instagram. So I had gotten off of Instagram for two and a half years just to better my mental health. Instagram was a really negative place for me. Mm -hmm. So I realized I'm like, you know what? I don't care about losing a bunch of followers. I had deleted my old Instagram and I was just like, I'm just going to start a new one just for the podcast. And that's how I'm going to promote it. And it's all going to be mental health positive. I'm only going to follow people that are fellow podcasters or are positive in my digital media environment. I barely follow any friends. It was one of those things where once I kind of created this, like, I don't know, this mentality for myself, then all of a sudden things started clicking. The podcast started just growing. I launched the podcast in August and it's just taken off. You know, I was able to go to Super Bowl and get so much done there, meet so many amazing people. And it's just been so great. And then now being able to co-host a second podcast and co-hosting yeah. Turbo Talk, yeah. which is fantastic. So, you know, and I fired my old agent and things have just really taken off. And I realized I'm like, you know what? I made all of this happen for myself. And I really am seeing a trend in so many people leaving the big media moguls to do more for themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I just, I realized that like, I don't need to worry so much about being affiliated with a certain brand or a certain TV station to build a career for yourself. Yeah. To, to yeah. determine if I'm successful or not, Absolutely. I can determine if I'm successful or not based on me trying, failing, trying, failing in this digital world. So that's kind of how it all happened. <laughs> that so exciting. And I love that your podcast focuses, like you said, on just, you know, athletes, not even helping them, but just kind of displaying that journey that they go through after they life talk. after sports. Life yeah. After sports. And just, it's so important. And it's so ironic with uh, last week's episode, like I said, focus on yeah. you know, post-retirement. I just think it's great to hear such positive journeys. I mean, I've listened to a few episodes and I just think it's super helpful because I think a lot of people struggle in retirement and figuring out what's next. And can you tell us like about the uh, for after? I know you probably get yeah. that question a lot. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, I, I get it because I'm sure you're the same way. Like I felt it like when I retired, Bridget, the dancer, Bridget, the cheerleader was gone, you know? Yeah. So I felt like when I started my show, I really wanted to help people who had been through what I had been through. I mean, it took me honestly, probably about four years to get back to where I am now, like a positive spirit, a positive mindset, really like just knowing that everything's going to be good, knowing that I have other passions in life, but really where the after orange slices stem from is like, when you think about being at dance or being at cheer or be playing youth sports after the game like during halftime or whatever it may be, usually like teen mom brings a snack. And a lot of times like growing up in the nineties, it was orange slices. So <laughs> that's kind of where it came from for me. I just thought, you know, after the game, after orange slices, you know, I struggled with my transition after NFL cheerleading, not being, you know, Bridget, the dancer anymore. So if I struggled with that, like what have other people struggled with after orange slices? Yeah. 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 What would be your advice, I guess, to people who are, you know, considering, you know, how you go to that point of questioning if it's your time to retire, whether you should audition again, and we're coming mm, up on auditions. Yeah. What would you say to people who are listening that are kind of processing that or scared about kind of like <sighs> after the orange slices, after being in an NFL as a cheerleader? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I would see where is your heart? Like, at the beginning of my career, my heart was so it with my team. That was the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. But by the time I had wrapped up my career, there were things that were more important. And the Chargers wasn't the most important thing to me anymore. And I just knew that, you know, it was a hard decision, but like my heart wasn't 100% in it anymore. Even though I didn't know what I was going to be without having practice all the time and being a dancer. Like I, I really didn't know what that looked like. I just felt like there wasn't that same joy. Like I had this level of burnout. I mean, I was dealing with injuries, of course, still too. But all of a sudden, I feel like there is a switch when you're just not 100% in love with what you're doing anymore. Yeah. And it's not fun. When it's not fun to go to practice anymore, you're doing it wrong. So when it's not fun, that's when, you know, most of the, my last season, it, yeah, it, it was pretty, it was rough. That's also because I just dealt with some bullying. So that doesn't help. 
but right you know. well that's interesting but, uh there was an episode for our podcast we call it mean girls but you know that's yeah. a very real aspect and I mean I love seeing on social media all the bonding and that you know does happen when you're on a team but yeah. there's also like the flip side of it where if you're not part of those cliques or crews or you're just kind of yes. like you're kind of involved in all of the bonding, but not really. And so it's something that a lot of listeners wrote in and kind of wanted to talk about, but you know, it does influence how you feel about going to practice, being a part of the team, yeah, um, going through all the stress and sacrifice and all of the things that you're going through to be, to make the commitment work. If you're not being fed in a, not a spiritual way, but just like, if it's not a positive experience for you yeah. from, from a mental and emotional standpoint. And I think you got to put yourself first in that regard. If, if it's damaging, I would say to your own psyche and how you feel about yourself. Exactly. Something to think about. Nobody needs to just like hold on to a toxic situation. Maybe there's another team or something like that. And it's not like to say anything bad about the entire team or the NFL as a whole is just a bunch of mean girls. It's not that. I just think it's a reality of it that, you know, it's just, the reality. <laughs> oh, it's, su- it's such a reality. It's, yeah. and it's really sad. And, but also I just think that half the time, like people don't realize it. And the thing is, is I feel like a lot of it stems from a lot of us being really unhappy with the conditions and the climate that we are working in, that we're dancing in, because if we were allowed to really be ourselves, I think it wouldn't feel so restrictive. And I just think it would be a little bit easier to just like, let go, let loose, you know, be with each other and not worry so much about somebody tattling on somebody else. And, you know, it's just, Oh yes, Oh yeah. You know, I I felt it, especially like my earlier years on the team where, uh you know, once you make your dream come true and you're on this team, there's this whole like vibe of, you know, there's an image to uphold and it's not just coming from leadership. It's coming from the vets on the team. And like, there's just this whole, image of what being a Seattle Seahawks cheerleader was supposed to be like and it's you know when people on the team didn't feel like the others were living up to it I mean it's all this mindset of protecting that image but yeah people running towards the director to tattle and just I mean it kind of can go absolutely berserk the tattling drove me insane I was like seriously are we in kindergarten (laughs) like if you have a problem with me come to me yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and it really depends on like, like, I'm sure you felt this way, like certain years are better than others. Like, cause it happened on my college team too, where like my freshman year was great because I had fantastic seniors on the team, but the rest of my years, I was really bullied by, and, and the thing is, is I, I let myself get bullied because I was always a people pleaser. So mm-hmm. that's also why, like I, was in that situation because I was always trying to make anybody my friend. I wasn't good at just being like, Oh, they don't want to be my friend. Oh, well now I am. I'm always just like, Oh, you don't like me. Sorry. Great. I used to bug my bullies to the point where like, it would probably drove them insane, but because I just wanted them to like me so badly. I wanted everybody on my team to like me, but I was bullied so heavily by a girl that was my year on the team in college. So bad. I almost transferred because it was, it was so, it was so detrimental to my mental health. Like she just did the most horrible, horrid things to me. Nobody would stand up for me. Right. right. So I could only stand up for myself. And by the time I was a senior, I I started to get better at it. But then also like, she hated me more because I kind of was just so like, Oh, whatever. You know, it's definitely rougher for them when you kind of take your power back and just like, you know, and start kind of not necessarily even giving it back to them, but just showing that you really can care less what they actually think about you. Exactly. Definitely a little bit of like, wait a minute. No, I'm going to try harder to keep effing with you. Totally. Exactly. I think, you know, when people know from either cheering, like in college, high school, whatever, when you know the mean girl dynamic exists, it's just like, please don't think it all miraculously goes away when you reach the pro level. I mean, hopefully you don't experience that on a team, but it's just the reality of it that those types that kind of just keep going through life and aren't really checked on their attitude or behavior, Mm -hmm. especially by leadership. I mean, they're, they're going to be around, unfortunately. And it's, it sucks. I know I was so like hyped up during that episode because it's just, they shouldn't have the power to ruin somebody else's experience. No, exactly. It can be like the most amazing experience ever. 
but not if you're dealing with stuff that's, you know, just unfavorable in that way, especially if you're at an age where it's harder to find a way to cope with it, especially if they have your director's ear. It's not. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's what happened when I was with the Chargers. Like, like we were talking about earlier, it was more of a click situation. So, you know, some of these clicks were going you know, to my coach and saying things to her, but my coach loved me. Like my pro coach really loved me and we had a good relationship. So she was having a hard time believing any of this stuff. It got to the point where at the end of the year, like after I had left next round of auditions, she just was like, no more mean girl stuff. I will not stand for it. Yeah, But, well, but she, awesome she basically though. stood up for like a lot of the girls that got bullied that whole year. And I really respected her for that being away from it so long now and being so much older, I'm just kind of like, A, we're not getting paid enough to be putting up with that shit, right? Like, oh, Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, mm. just, Yeah, and it's yeah. just like, I don't have to be your cup of tea. It's just like a base level of respect that people show towards one another. Totally. And then yeah. all just kind of focus on having great performances. And, you know, you don't really have to have each other's back all that much other than just like not going and tattling about or making shit up but you know what I mean just we can coexist and not all be exactly exactly and I wish more people were okay with that and would realize like hey this is a job this isn't like a middle school team like it doesn't it doesn't all have to be a sisterhood and rainbows like it it can be a job like right so like any job you have you learn how to get along with your coworkers. why can't it be like that it so. absolutely should. It absolutely should. So I have a question for you. So I am a little sports head. I used to be a lot, a lot more into it. But in terms of like watching ESPN and sports shows and so forth, and I started to get a little annoyed at seeing a woman on ESPN or any of those shows just kind of not so much now, but I would say back when I stopped, right? Because it was just, you know, beautiful girl, cute dress, kind of serving as like a mediate, like a facilitator of a conversation amongst, you know, men yeah. and then not really being able to add what I'm sure she had in her head. To add content. Yeah. Yeah. And it was starting to piss me off because it just was annoying after a while because it's like, I'm sure these women had to know, I mean, they know sports They're They made it this far, but this is what their role has been reduced to. Tell me about your journey as a female Sports well, oh my gosh let me I know that could be like a whole other episode but I just seriously I mean like I mean my last job I can't even tell you like I oh my gosh my co-anchor that I worked with he was just whoa he was just a funny funny well, dude yeah. okay uh, but I did not feel appreciated in that position as far as like knowing my stuff. Hey, like I have a whole different perspective on being on the field for such a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't able to get the opportunities, the same opportunities as my male counterpart was, you know, it was really frustrating. And so a lot of times I would just kind of get the short end of the stick on certain content that we would go cover. Um, I wouldn't get to go cover the big events, certain games, things like that. And it just was really frustrating. And just also people assuming all the time that just because I was a pretty girl that I didn't know anything. Um, I would get emails all the time from viewers that would say things like, get that blonde bimbo off the TV screen. She's a waste of my time. That hussy, her shirt is too low. Like her cleavage is exploding in front of my face. And I'm like, I am a size A cup. How do I have, I do not have cleavage. (laughs) But, and it was usually a lot of times women um, but it's always, well, not always women, but often, yeah, too often. Women. I would get really mean emails all the time, but it also, again, like helped me develop really thick skin. And I just would laugh and be like, you know what? Like someday, like I'm going to prove all these people wrong. And that's what really inspired me to, to start my own show was to be able to talk about what I wanted. And now I'm co-hosting another podcast with Robert Turbin, who is a Super Bowl champion and respects me enough to want me there, like as his counterpart and as his producer. Like, so that makes me feel very respected. Since I started my own show, I've seen a huge turn in me gaining a lot more respect. I think because people have just seen that, like I'm working so hard on my own, but it's definitely kept me from taking a lot of jobs that were more just like super hosty and more just about like, let's go hang and let's go learn about like your favorite foods and your favorite 
color and things like that. Like, right, right. no, We're that's not just actually talking sports. Yeah. And that's not me. And the thing is, it's like, there's nothing bad about it. It's just, that's just not ever what I've wanted to do. And I had the opportunity. I actually interviewed for a job like that about three years ago at Fox Sports West. And I thought like, this is my end. This is going to be it. And I almost got the job and then I didn't. And my heart was broken. I'm so glad I didn't because it made me hustle. I would have been so conceited. Everything would have been given to me and I wouldn't have had to work so hard and go to another small market and and work my ass off. I'm totally self-made. And like, I'll tell you another story. I've shared this a lot with my listeners. I was working with a trainer for a few months. I'm not working with them anymore and you'll see why. But I was working with this trainer who I never felt like really respected me. He would, you know, talk about certain things and just would talk around me in a way that sometimes made me feel like he felt like he had to educate me about certain things. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. Like I'm a journalist. Like I'm not an idiot, right. <laughs> but like, Oh my God, is this anyway. what you ended up going off on Twitter? Yeah. About? Yeah. Oh, so, wow. um, yeah. So, so what ended up happening one day is he was just, there were four people in the gym and it was all guys. And he ended up saying, how he went on this whole analysis on how the sports culture has changed over the years, right? So then he goes, and no offense, Bridget, but I effing, drops a whole F-bomb, I effing hate female sports analysts. They have no idea what they're talking about. Okay. And just goes off about how women don't belong in sports and know nothing about sports. So I'm just sitting there listening to this, trying to figure out like, ooh, do I be passive and just like let this roll over or do I stand up for myself? And I'm like, mm-hmm. ooh, old Bridget would have just, you know, been passive. Nope. Like, let's go, new Bridget. Bridget, Bridget. No, uh. Bridget. <laughs> I was like, uh uh-uh. uh. And no. he even tried to like put his hand on my shoulder and I was like, like uh-huh. pulled back real fast. And he was like, Ooh, Ooh, like, and he was like, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. And I was like, I just went off and I was like, do you realize you just basically said that women don't belong in this industry, in the industry that I work in. And he was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I hurt your feelings. And I'm like, Oh, you, you, you're, you didn't hurt my feelings. You just basically said you offended every single woman and said that we can't do things that men can do. It was just, Oh my gosh. And he didn't understand he thought that he just hurt my feelings. He didn't understand that what he said was wrong. Disrespectful and wrong. Yes. But oh. the thing is, is you run across guys like that all the time. Very misogynistic and just, it's so interesting. But honestly, like that fueled me up more. And so again, to be like now co-hosting a show with like somebody who could have the pick of the litter makes me feel validated just knowing like I matter. Like, and that's cool. And you know, right. Counts. Like seriously, like yeah. our perspective as women is, is very different. And I know that there's probably a lot more in the digital space, like you said, where people are probably taking matters in their own hands. Like we're not going to wait for you to cover things, yeah. you know, women's sports the way that you ought to. Like we're just going to, I'm sure there's podcasts that are just blowing up out there just from talking yeah. about women's sports yeah. because there's just not a lot of representation. But mm-hmm. do you think like the, this negative stereotypes and just like the disrespect around us not having a brain is, is it worse in sports in terms of, you know, being a sports analyst as a woman or the stigma around being a cheerleader or a professional? Oh, that's a good question. I think that's the thing is I feel like I have a double whammy. Yeah. So I, it's, do. <laughs> it's both, it's bad both ways. So it's like either people think it's really cool that I cheered in the NFL or people are like, oh, like, yeah. you know, they it's use that again. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. But the thing is, is like that kind of weeds out the bad ones for me. You know, it's pretty easy. And ever since I've been on my own, like initially at my last few jobs, I didn't want people to know I was a cheerleader because I wanted to make it on my own so badly. But then once I started my own show, I realized, you know what? Use it, use it to fuel your brand. But it was because I had had people who made me feel so guilty about something that I shouldn't feel guilty for. And it was just so many people that put me down for no reason and didn't want to see me succeed at these jobs, like in a man's world. But Mm -hmm. once I realized, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use it. I don't care what people think, but now that I'm running my own brand, I am going to brand myself as Bridget, the cheerleader, as Bridget, the mental health advocate, as Bridget, the journalist, as Bridget, the sports fanatic. Like there are so many parts of me that people connect with and 
now it's just all so positive. And I feel like now I can be like truly honest and transparent. And to me, like that's where I've been able to find so much happiness now is because I'm able to be 100% transparent with people. And I'll talk about my mental health journey. I'll talk about the things I've been through. I'll talk about being arrested and spending a night in jail in college. Like I'll talk about things that I felt so reserved from for such a long time because I had to be, whether it was because I was cheering and upholding that image for the Chargers or whether I was working at a news station and I was upholding that image as, you know, a sports anchor. Right. Now it's like, I'm just Bridget. And yes, I am a sportscaster. Like I am hosting my own podcast. I'm doing all of these really exciting things, but I get to be Bridget and I don't have to apologize for it. And I'm not getting calls from people being like, you said this, blah, blah, blah on the air. And you can't say that. No, like now I'm being celebrated for being me and for what I'm saying. It gives other people the courage to do the same. I get, cannot tell you how many messages I get from strangers all the time, all the time, who will just be like, I listened to your podcast or I saw your post and it inspired me to come out of the closet. It inspired me to like start my own business, it inspired me to go get help with my depression, certain things like that make me feel so good that to know that just, I just helped one person, but right. I, I cannot believe like the response from people who have just seen transparency as something that is just so new, you know? So that's yes. really what it is for me. Well, kudos to you. Seriously. I was so excited to see just everything that you've established in such a short time. And it has to be so freeing, seriously, to be able to do and just speak in your own voice and say what you have to say and just talk sports like I just think it's dope I really do because I know the Thanks. frustration that I would feel and um, I think everybody that I speak sports with like my guy friends or whoever they they respect what I have to say right uh, but never really is that tension but I can't imagine trying to put my thoughts and perspective out there for everyone to consume knowing how ridiculous you know totally the, no the exactly TV. But it's awesome that to be able to have your own space, create your own lane and start your own thing. And so I'm just so happy that you shared your time with the podcast today. Oh my gosh, of like, course, it's, anytime. It's so, so cool. Every episode ends with like either just sharing some juicy locker talk stories of like funny memories or the things that stick out from your cheerleading days. Or I love Drop It Like It's Hot because it's just like a bunch of random ass questions that you can answer however you okay. want it. Which one do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I, and what, what do you want to do? You tell me. Hmm. Well, since there is a question here about arrest, but isn't, you know, <laughs> I think drop it like it's hot. You're too fun. So you ready? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Since it's audition season, I'll ask this one. What's the biggest lesson you learned about auditions? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them. Um, people are always watching. So when you're talking to other girls, like in the hallways, whatever it may be, don't, don't talk shit on other people and Ooh. don't say bad, like, don't say bad things, like nothing, like you are always on. You don't know what judge is walking around in the bathroom, nothing, like you don't know. Somebody's always around. So That's golden ass advice, people, mm -hmm. because that is so true. We heard that from directors too. They're listening, they're watching. Yep. Yeah, you're on from the minute you walk through that door. Exactly. Okay, good one. Let's see. Do you have a favorite choreographer or dancer that you follow? Oh, I mean, there are so many good ones now because like now social media is so fun to. Right. You get to um, see the work and get the names associated with the kids. Exactly. Names. It's, it's really, it's, it's so amazing. There's so many fantastic ones out there now. Um, Cause I follow quite a few um, Paris. What's her name? Who did the oh, Super Bowl? The yummy thing. Uh, yeah. Super, yeah. Okay. I can't think of how to say And her. she did. Yeah. And she yeah. did. Yeah. I, I don't know how to say her last. She's fantastic. I mm -hmm. love her. She's New Ze from New Zealand. The thing is, is like, I realize I'm like, I've gotten to work with some amazing, I'm so young and I got to work with like amazing people over the years that like all randomly just see pop up and random stuff. And I'm like, Oh, I forgot. I worked with them. And, and it's, it's just cool. Eighties or nineties dance music. Eighties for sure. Okay. But, but I'm actually like 70s is like my jam. Like I'm disco. Like ABBA is my favorite band of all time. Okay. So 70s is more of my like, yeah. Your vibe. All right. I got you. Got you. What personality trait has gotten you in the most trouble? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say two. My people pleasing issue, which I've gotten better at, but also um, me not being able to shut my mouth. 
oh, I'm in the same boat. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a spirit animal? Uh, yeah, an alpaca. Okay, now you have to say why. I love alpacas. They are so gentle and they're docile animals. People don't know that much about them. I want to own an alpaca farm once I like buy my own house. I want to have a small alpaca farm because you don't need that much room for them. And they're such sweet animals and they don't make any noise. And oh my gosh, I just love them. So like when I was Mm -hmm. up in Eastern Washington, there are so many alpaca farms up there. I don't know if you've been to any of them, but like there are a ton. If you just drive through Yeah. So I got to hang out at a lot of alpaca farms while I was up there and I just fell in love with these animals. I just, I just love them. So I have lots of stuffed alpacas and like my aunt who, um, I'm really close with anytime she sees an alpaca, like a stuffed one or an iron one or something, she usually, she buys it for me. It's like, I have so many alpacas. Okay. So then let's see Twitter or Instagram, just because I adore your Instagram page. But I've also, you know, it used to be Twitter. Twitter. It used to be Twitter, but I don't get as much traction on Twitter anymore. I think because the algorithm changed. So, like, I get no feed, like, no one sees my tweets. So, <laughs> so now Instagram. Okay. Instagram's been fun. It's a great way to interact with people, too. And that's how we found each other. So, exactly. Uh, let's see. Favorite place to travel? Probably France. I love France. Oh, well, me too. Oh, it's just so beautiful. Favorite city? <laughs> I would say Saint-Tropez. Like, I love the south of France. is so beautiful. Yeah. It's just oh gosh, like... I'm going back this summer. It's a small town called Set, but they have this huge music festival. Uh, it's oh, like my gosh. Festival, that's so it's cool. Water. It's so cool. I haven't done, gone to, like, the more fabulous, like, larger cities. One yeah. Longer, but it's just... Oh, no, cool. that's going to be so fun. Mm-hmm. All right. One more. Let's see. I'm going to pick a good one. Well, I'm going to ask this one just because you mentioned this arrest business. But if you were... <laughs> If you were arrested with no explanation, what would your friends and family assume you had done? Um, yeah, that kind of basically happened to me. So my senior year in college, it was right after a football game. It was like pouring rain. It was the first weekend back of school. So there was a no tolerance policy. They were just being really, really strict. Because my freshman year, we had had riots. It's I've seen like we're ranked right. as one of the top as one of the top riots um, ever in like the history of college campuses. Yeah. We had, I was running away from tear gas and like fire bombs and like, it was crazy. And this, that was like my first weekend, like in Oregon as a freshman. Wait, like, right. It's over what? Like the ending of a game, right? No, no, this, I, I don't even remember. I think it was just being back at school. That was a different thing, but that's when they started cracking down on security. So by the time it was my senior year, the first weekend back, because there were always these crazy things and cars were always on fire and stuff. They were like, anybody who gets any kind of ticket, a misdemeanor is getting arrested and going to jail. So it was my boyfriend at the time's 21st birthday. He was turning 21 at midnight and I was trying to walk across the street so that we could go celebrate for his birthday. And this is where I made the mistake and I'm such an idiot, but basically I opened a cider at my house And then I put the cap back on. I hadn't drank it anything. And then I walked outside. And as I open the door and step out onto the sidewalk, a bike cop comes riding by. No way. And just like asks me what I what's in my hand. And I should have just been, I don't know what I don't know what I would have done. But anyway, he takes it from me, takes the cap off, pours the whole bottle out, and is like, I have to take you to jail. What? And I started busting up laughing because I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything and I'm 21. And he's like, open container. And I'm like, but I haven't even drinking it yet. Like I, you could breathalyze me. And he's like, it doesn't matter. Like it's an open container anyway. So I was arrested in front of all of these people, everybody watching. Like I was like put down on the car, handcuffed, everything. Were they rough and, with you or anything? Or yeah, they- yeah. One of them was. And it was really frustrating because by the time the nicer cop came and who was like there to babysit me until like the car came to like come get me, it was so weird because they were so busy picking up so many people that night. I basically kept saying to the cop, I'm like, do you have children, sir? How would you feel if they made a little mistake and then you ruin their life because of it? Like, I forget what I said, but all I was thinking about was, oh my gosh, like I'm not going to be able to cheer in the NFL. Like, they're going to find out. Like, that was all I was thinking about at the time. Wow. Um, Because I had known 
a girl who had gotten a DUI and been excused from auditions for the Cowboys. And of oh, course, a DUI is different, but I also just figured like- I mean, it was over I, an open container. Exactly, like, yeah. yeah. So I get to jail and I get thrown in this room with like like 20 frat guys, right? So they're all kind of talking amongst themselves and the cop in there is asking me like, well, what'd you do? And I'm like, I just like had a bottle and I was walking across the street. And he's like, then why did they take you in? And I'm like, cause you guys have this stupid no tolerance policy tonight. And then like one of these guys in the room, these are just like stupid drunk kids. And one of them goes, you look really familiar. And the other one's like, oh yeah. He's like, I think I've seen you. And he's like, I have a poster of you on my wall. And the other one goes, yeah, I saw you at the game today. You're that cheerleader. And just screaming it for like the whole jail oh to hear. And I'm just like, thank you so much. <laughs> so anyway, so then I get like put in this room, the cell with a heroin addict who's like wigging out. And I felt so bad. She was so cold that she asked me if I had my period. And I said, no, because all we had was a toilet and some pads and like a TV that didn't work. So she took the pads and started sticking them all over her body because she was so cold because I think she was like detoxing oh, or I mean, or, or withdrawal, withdrawal, whatever. You know, it was so sad. And she's asking me like what happened. And then, and I'm like, oh, like I'm trying to be nice and ask her. And she's like, oh, you know, I just was trying to go back and get my kid from my mom who stole him from me, even though like, it sounds like she's not even the guardian of her own child anymore. You know what I mean? It was like right, right, all right. these things. And, and I, so I tried to burn her house down and, but I was going to go shoot up my, with my boyfriend. Cause I'm upset. And she's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, I just was trying to go out for my boyfriend's birthday. And I had an open bottle. <laughs> oh my gosh. And she's, and she was just like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, why is she being so nice to me? Like she probably thinks I'm such a wuss, but luckily my parents were in town. So my parents had to come and pick me up. My dad let the sheriff have it. Like, oh my gosh. He went off on him. And my dad is the most quiet, peaceful guy ever. So it was really bad. And then finally, like we got it expunged. So it's not on my record anymore. And we right. fought it like, so, oh my gosh. But I had to still, I had to fly up and back while, once I made chargers. I had to fly up and back to do alcohol awareness and drug classes. It was ridiculous. Stop. Yeah, oh it was God. so insane. On top it of everything so else that you were doing, yeah, going it was through. so nuts. So, yeah, so it was pretty crazy. But honestly, I'm so glad it happened. It gave me a huge appreciation for just what people go through. You know, I've never been in prison, but something I really want to work on is prison reform because I know that there are so many people wrongly incarcerated yeah. every single day. And I think it's a huge problem in America. And it's something that like, I'm super passionate about fixing. And I think it kind of stemmed from that, you know, I've never been in real prison, but just for my little, like naive personality, just being in jail for one night gave me enough to be like, Hey, like real yeah. stuff goes on in this world and you know, we need to fix it. So Definitely crazy. Well, I yeah. seriously cannot thank you enough, Bridget. This has been <laughs> such a fun conversation. I know. It's been and so great. Thank you for having me. Of course. And I will definitely be providing the link to your podcast for people to check out. Yes, because I have two podcasts now. So I know. Clearly, out. this is awesome. Yeah. You're going to stay very, very busy, but you've interviewed some really cool people and can't wait to see what's on the new podcast as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You are pretty dope. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. No, of course. Anytime. And I can't wait to eventually have you on my After Orange Slices podcast. It will be oh, so awesome. Gosh. So It will I, be very weird to be yeah. on the other side. Oh my gosh. It's fun. It's, it's definitely fun. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. You can follow your favorite podcast on social media at Pro Cheerleading Podcast on Instagram, at Pro Cheer Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can support your favorite podcast on Patreon. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sidelines.